I think the BitNet, uh, the, the founding of BitNet in 1981 is what uh, primarily brings me here today. Uh, BitNet was created in 1981 at a time when uh, there really wasn't a lot of connectivity among scholars, faculty uh, in the world. Uh, the primary way of communicating was by either telephone or fax machine. And uh, in 1981, 1980, 81, um, I felt uh, that uh, the world needed something better than that. And I knew about ARPANET. And uh, when asked by some people, why did you start BitNet, I think the, the fact is I was envious of ARPANET users. Uh, ARPANET was, of course, a network developed uh, with government funding from ARPA, from Department of Defense, and it was only available to a relatively small number of schools, colleges, universities uh, within the United States, and a few research laboratories like Stanford Research, uh, research Institute. And I thought, this is really great, but when is it ever going to be available and affordable to uh, a much larger group? And so I decided that um, I would try to create a network uh, that would reach a larger audience. And I knew that to do that, I couldn't uh, develop a lot of new technology. And so I modeled BitNet after another network, the IBM corporate network. This was the network that connected all of the IBM locations, uh, manufacturing plants, research laboratories, and so on throughout the world. It was at that time, in 1980, 81, uh, probably the largest network in the world. Uh, but of course, it was all internal to IBM. It didn't connect to any of their customers or, or anyone else. And so uh, this technology that IBM had developed to develop their network uh, was part of everyone's IBM uh, software. Um, and I knew that many universities ran the IBM uh, mainframes, ran IBM mainframes and had this software. And so I went to my colleague, uh, Gray Freeman, who was at Yale University, and I said, uh, would you be interested in connecting Yale to the City University of New York? And uh, he said, sounds like a, a winner of an idea. And so we connected. And then I invited uh, 34 other colleges and universities, primarily in the Eastern United States. And I told them what we were doing. And I said, uh, would you be interested in connecting? And um, I guess it was one of those things, the right idea uh, at the right time, because a lot, most of those universities, colleges and universities decided to connect. I, th I think that uh, the, the network in the United States, after we uh, decided to model this after existing technology that was readily available, I think that it grew rather smoothly in the United States. Um, there were always colleges and universities that had to be maybe persuaded. Um, I did a lot of traveling at that time in the US. Uh, but I think the bigger challenge was when uh, IBM was willing to pay for the links, but connecting some of the institutions in Europe was a little harder. It wasn't because they weren't interested. They were absolutely excited about being able to share research results with colleagues in the United States. The bigger problem was the, uh, the PTTs, the telephone companies, that are entrenched entities in many of these European nations. Um, some of these PTTs uh, have perhaps more influence than their own, than the government of the nation uh, that they're in. Um, and then there was another organization called the CEPT, which was the um, sort of mother organization for all of the PTTs. And this CEPT set a set of rules about what you could do and couldn't do if you had a leased telephone line. So the way BitNet worked, or Earn worked, was you connect one node with another, and then uh, each node passes traffic for each other node. So if you're connecting A to C, you go through B. B has to be allowed to send traffic to C. The PTTs had a rule that said you can't do that. Uh, if you want to send traffic from A to C, you buy a line from A to C. You don't buy a line from A to B, B to C, and then share the link. And that took a lot of effort, mostly on the part of the people there. I mean, I used to attend meetings, and I was always amazed at how difficult it was because it seemed so easy in the United States. No one really questioned th what, what was generically called third-party traffic uh, in the United States. But in, in Europe, that was a no-no. 
Um, and so it took a lot of effort to get past that. Um, I think the other thing that stands out as a, I suppose, um, a, a rel an achievement with respect to uh, the growth of the network that was hard was when we decided to try to connect Russia. Uh, it was then the USSR. But um, the idea, and you have to remember this is 1983 or so, 84, um, feelings about Russia uh, were not uh, warm enough to suggest that it would be easy to connect uh, our countries. And the control over that uh, kind of uh, export, is what it was considered, uh, came under the US Department of Commerce. And I had uh, many meetings, as did others working uh, at BitNet, uh, with uh, the Department of Commerce to persuade them that it was OK to run a line from uh, Moscow uh, back to, uh, well, through Urn and, and then to the United States in order to have scholars there communicate with, with scholars in the United States. And we finally did do that. And we were the first uh, to connect Russia. So that was, I think, an achievement. And uh, it, 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 uh, I don't know if it changed the relationship between the countries, but it certainly helped with research that was going on, especially in the uh, physical sciences. I became uh, very aware of the IBM network uh, because of friends who worked at IBM's Yorktown Heights laboratory. And I remember in particular conversation with Peter Kapek. Uh, he worked at the lab. We had gone to, uh, we knew each other in high school and college. And he was uh, the person I think most responsible in IBM for growing their corporate network. Um, and I think one day we were sitting around and sort of the idea occurred to one of us, you know, well, why not do this for colleges and universities? Uh, and that's kind of where it started. That's an interesting question. And I, I can say that in some ways, my answer to the question is modified or is changed a bit just by the last day here uh, at the Internet Society's uh, 25th anniversary, but mostly because of the 25 under 25. Um, presentations that, that we've had in this last uh, day. Um, and the reason I say that is, you know, the internet, of course, is a wonderful um, infrastructure. And uh, it does permit, you know, everyone to have a voice and everyone to speak up and, and communicate. Uh, but to see what some of these young people, and they range as, I think, as young as 17, uh, are doing with the internet. You know, the kinds of changes that they're trying to bring to their countries throughout the world um, to really help others is uh, absolutely inspiring. And so, you know, I, I, I love the fact that the Internet Society, uh, through the Hall of Fame and, and in other ways, uh, tries to remember the history. That's great. But the truth is, the future is all about the kinds of people that we've seen the last couple of days. And hearing their stories is just wonderful. So um, you know, my hope for the future of the internet is we'll see more of that, um, and that uh, others will be encouraged to do similar things in their countries. Well, I think there's plenty of work to do. Um, and, and some of it is still with infrastructure. Some of it is still uh, with the technologies that undergird the internet. I mean, for example, um, the original internet, or the ARPANET, was not really designed to be um, a secure network in terms of its users. It, it was meant to be secure in terms of survivable in the event of a nuclear uh, attack, but uh, perhaps not as much thought, for good reason, was given to uh, what about uh, bad actors uh, who get access to the network and try to do bad things. And so there's plenty of work to do in that way, in that regard. Also, I don't think anyone uh, could have anticipated the growth of the internet. You know, the fact that, for example, we we've, we've run out of addresses for devices with uh, what's called IPv4, and now we have to go to longer addresses with IPv6 just to keep up with the growth of the Internet of Things and so on.